Good evening and welcome to McLean's Live. I'm Paul Wells, senior writer from McLean's Magazine, speaking to you from uh, my living room in Ottawa, as is so often the case. Um, we are grateful, as always, to our sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association for bringing these weekly discussions to you. And uh, tonight we have a lot to talk about. We had a funeral yesterday in Houston for George Floyd, who was killed on May 25th in Minneapolis after a police officer held his knee on Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds while two other officers held him down and a fourth officer held bystanders away so they could not intervene. Since that uh, terrible event, the uh, wave of protests, almost all peaceful, often rep repressed with extraordinary scenes of police violence across the United States and to some extent around the world have transfixed us all. Um, I thought it would be uh, a good time to kick off two weeks of discussions around these issues. First, the American scene, and then next week, uh, uh, the Canadian context. Uh, tonight, we are uh, honored to have two distinguished observers of American life and culture join us. Uh, Carol Anderson, uh, from her home in Atlanta, uh, is the uh, Charles Howard Candler Professor of African American Studies and the Chair of African American Studies at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, she is the author, among many other books, of White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Nation's Divide, uh, which was on most of the year-end lists in 2016. And her more recent book is One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. And we will have a chance to talk a little bit about that tonight, too. Uh, joining us from New York is, or from near New York, is Kevin Young, the uh, director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library, and poetry editor of The New Yorker, where he is also the host of the Poetry Podcast. He's the author of 13 books, including uh, his most recent poetry collection, Brown, and his essay collection, The Gray Album. In September, the Library of America will release his anthology, African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song. 1150 pages, I'm told by Amazon, and I, I'm looking forward to uh, buying my copy. Um, I guess, uh, Professor Anderson, let's start with a very general question. Does what's happening in the last two weeks feel like uh, a moment of real change in America? Yes, it does. Um, it does because I think one of the things is that we have a 50 state protest movement happening. So this just isn't in um, California or in New York. We're seeing protests happening in Utah and Wyoming and Montana. Um, so that part is different. But I think what is driving this is that we have a regime in power in the White House that has made it very clear that it is an existential threat to democracy. So whereas the, the previous conversations have been seem to just kind of hone in on police brutality, the fact that you have this existential threat to democracy writ large is bringing out so many other people who had previously felt that the issue of police brutality didn't affect them. But the issue of the destruction of American democracy affects all of us. And I think that that's what feels so different. Um, your book, White Rage, um, chronicles several moments in American history, really five broad epochs in American history, where it looked like progress was coming on the front of racial reconciliation, and then it was cheated or rolled back through concerted action. So um, if I take a general lesson from the book, it is guard against false optimism. Yes. Are you similarly worried now? Yes, um, it is very easy. I mean, I, it's the, when you think about, for instance, the civil rights movement or the, the election of Barack Obama, these were held as these like two major, we have arrived moments uh, where America seemed to be jettisoning its, its, its slaveholding past and its Jim Crow roots. And to, to, to envision a broader, much more inclusive, vibrant democracy, only to see the civil rights movement end up with the war on drugs and mass incarceration, and only to see uh, the election of Barack Obama 
end up with Donald Trump. So the forces that created that are forces within the culture in terms of narratives about who is valued and who isn't and how we got here and how we didn't get here. But it is also about the ways that laws and policies are then come up to undercut that, those advances. And so what the war on drugs did, for instance, um, while couching itself as protecting democracy and protecting our communities, was to mass incarcerate Black people, to criminalize Blackness in a way, so that the, the protections of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act would no longer apply to them. What we saw with Barack, Barack Obama was massive voter suppression, laws coming in to, to systematically undermine and destroy the access to the ballot box for that broad coalition that helped him get into office. So we have to be mindful of the narrative tricks as well as the policy tricks um, that do the damage. Okay. Um, Kevin Young, um, I'll, I'll put essentially the same question to you. How do you um, see the events of the last two weeks fitting into a broader American context? You know, I think they fit in uh, too well. Uh, I think uh, Professor Anderson, my old colleague, uh, is so good about talking about uh, that history, and I would leave it to her to describe it. You know, I'm here in Harlem right now, and so the mood, I think, is one of the things that is different. Uh, we were all uh, quarantining, and people have masks on, and, you know, are walking around tenderly, and then to have such brutality uh, scene and I couldn't watch the whole video by any means um, and you know one could go nuts doing that but what you see instead I think is people's not just they weren't just cooped up uh, uh, you know physically they're also cooped up emotionally out the outrage and the disparities in how COVID uh, showed itself which you know happened nowhere else uh, it happened here in the U.S. which told us a lot about what was these underlying conditions not of uh, black people or brown people, but of the US. And so I, I think that's the real, one of the main triggers that you're seeing too, that don't forget, we're still under quarantine. Uh, certainly in the city, um, we're just starting to open back up. And I think that that's not, you know, people are risking their health in order to stand in the street uh, and not just from uh, police, but also from, you know, this virus that is striking people unevenly uh, and killing people unevenly, I should say. It's striking everyone, but uh, and I think that that really is part of what you're seeing in the unrest is, is a realization that these two pandemics, uh, one of, of a virus and one of racism, are, are persistent, are dangerous, and, and are killing us unequally. Yeah. Um, have people, in, in your estimation, simply um, uh, forgotten or gotten tired of the quarantine and the lockdown? and set that aside, gone off down this other thing? Or how well, do you You know, you do see people with their um, mask like around their chin. Um, <laughs> so there is a kind of, you know, where people are trying to survive. So um, it is hard. But at the same time, I think it's also a sign of people have done what they were asked to do, which is people did for the most part keep distant. They, they stayed inside. They wore masks outside, which was sometimes conflicting information about what masks can do and what they should do. But now I think you see people generally wearing masks and, and you know, um, I certainly don't want there to be a resurgence. Uh, no one does, but um, it's, there's also this important insurgency that has to happen. And um, I, I think that, you know, I, I certainly feel that I understand why people are doing that and why we all are invested in this change of the system that uh, got us to this point. And, you know, these videos, they're almost, uh, I mean, how many have there been? You know, and Ahmaud Aubrey right there in Atlanta was very recent. Um, and in all these cases, it wasn't until um, online and in the street action that got uh, justice started. Yeah. And I think part of what we're also seeing is the kind of expendability of life. So that you've got, the United States had the wherewithal to shut the coronavirus down. And you had a regime in power that chose, made a deliberate choice not to use all of the, the scientists and the wherewithal to be able to do that. 
And so it was just a, a, a hardcore calculation about the expendability of life that has led us to over 110,000 deaths and has led us to what 1.9 million cases. So you get that. Then you get the economy collapsing mm -hmm. on top of that. So you've got 40 million unemployed. You're looking at double digit unemployment rates that are almost like the depression era. Sure. You have, again, a regime in power that is diddling around trying to figure out how not to provide the kind of economic support that people need in order to be able to stay quarantined and make the coronavirus flatten out. And then you add on to that the police brutality that is so captured on these films. I, I think of George Floyd's, uh, the video of George Floyd's death, like I think of the picture of Emmett Till in the casket um, after he was killed, the way that you had the, the killer so casually squatting on his neck, hand in pocket, looking at the camera, it, it, it reeked of all of the impunity that all of these other components, so it just converged together and people said enough already. Um, and particularly because this regime has shredded so many of the institutions of democracy that the only way that people felt that they could be heard was to in fact go out into the streets. And so this is what we're seeing here, it, it is we're seeing the kind of insurgency. I, I have said that Trump has debased so many of our institutions, but what he couldn't debase were the people. And that's what we're seeing. When you see those crowds out in D.C., and when you see them out in, in New York and in Philadelphia, you're seeing this, this in Atlanta, in Utah, you're seeing this kind of sense of people being willing to put their lives on the line for this democracy because this regime and its minions have chosen not to. That's why this moment feels so different. Um, one could also argue, I've seen it argued by Jamal Bowie in the New York Times a couple days ago, that the police are also almost systematically helping to make the point of the Black Lives Matter activists. That uh, when the wave was, you know, you see them shoving down older people into the street for no apparent reason it, and their badges covered. That's a bad look, you know, it's, it's tough to, to, but I interrupted, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, it, it's, I mean, a lot of interactions between police and the population can be close calls, tough calls, hard to parse. But when you see vehicles move, um, um, driving into crowds, when you see uh, police cars uh, driving past uh, uh, nonviolent uh, protesters who aren't at that moment protesting and spraying pepper spray onto them, right. uh, it, 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 that seems like a lot less of a close call. That seems pretty cut and dried, um, uh, abuse of power. I think that one of the things that we're seeing too is why we have this kind of awakening, is that the abuse that we saw in Minneapolis is the regions where we're seeing this incredible police brutality. So if this had happened in the deep South, right, it would have allowed the nation to go, well, yeah, well, you know, that's the South. But to have George Floyd's killing in Minneapolis, which is, you know, way up North, and is seen as one of a, of a liberal bastion, that this kind of brutality could happen in Minneapolis. And then when you go to Buffalo and you see the police shove down a 75 year old man and his head hit that concrete, he's bleeding out of his ear and they walk by as if he doesn't even exist. So the regions where you see this up in, up in New York, and that it shows that no one is safe. There is no protection from a regime that is steeped in impunity. And what Trump's Department of Justice did was to dismantle 
so many of the federal oversight protections of these brutal police forces that arose out of the Ferguson uprising. Mm -hmm. And so when you see that he, they're given full license to this, so in the power of the technology, it was just like the civil rights movement, how the power of that technology of television was so transformative for the movement, the power of these cell phones and social media that bring to the fore cops kicking people who, you know, a woman who's just sitting down already in distress. It's like, why are you doing that? Hitting an Australian uh, film crew. Uh, why are you doing that? And it's causing that kind of introspection and reflection and then activism. Well, and I think there's something about witnessing in all of this. Uh, you know, I think about what it means to witness and witnessing isn't just seeing something, it's also saying something. And, and there's something about that that's powerful. Um, you know, we all saw, it, whether we watched the video or not, we saw images from George Floyd's death and at the same time, then you had the next day, like the official autopsy and the official police version, which made no sense. If you, you know, and, and one's lying eyes, uh, you know, are hard to, you know, one believes them, you know. So it's really tough to, to kind of then change your mindset and, and believe anything you read. And so it becomes really, there's this disconnect. Uh, and some of that, I think, I've been thinking about it a lot because I wrote a book called Bunk about the history of the hoax in American life and how central it was and how tied it is to race. Um, and I think you see that too with COVID, sort of some people believing it's a hoax when, you know, I know people who were touched by it, uh, folks who yes. died from it, you know, yes. it becomes, you know, really tough that science isn't believed where, where around race science is you know, paramount. So all these kind of conflicting issues that I think speak to deep divides uh, in American history, which come through the hoax and come through questions of science and power, uh, really play themselves out. And just the mere fact of walking around uh, in the city and wanting to be safe, you know, that's what we've spent the past few months trying to do. And suddenly, you can't be safe, uh, you know, from the people who are supposed to protect you. And I think that's a really tough yeah disconnect and dis dissonance that people are also reacting to. Yeah. That's an interesting, an interesting aspect of it that hadn't occurred to me. It's kind of a clarifying moment at a time in our, uh, our collective history when it, we might have despaired that anything would ever be clarified. Sure. I mean, I don't want to overstate the innocence of earlier ages, but the extent to which the truth itself is litigated just constantly these days. And then there's almost the only thing that everyone believes, which is, which is uh, camera phone video, uh, uh, comes up and, and, and says, well, no, this is what happened. This is what's happening now. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. a, a bit of a paradox, I guess. Well, we've been there before. I mean, Rodney King, uh, you know, uh, makes us remember. I mean, I started thinking about that a lot. I started thinking a lot about Emmett Till, uh, yeah. as Carol was saying, who I think, you know, it isn't just how he was killed, it was also the bravery of his mother to show how he was killed and his face, you know? And I think that hearing his voice, uh, George Floyd, and, and seeing his death, I mean, it's just horrifying. And I think that it's sad that it's taken these brutalized black bodies to have us come to these reckonings, but I think it is really important. Um, and there's a kind of bravery in the testimony, you know, and I'm not far from Central Park here in Harlem, and just a week before all this, remember, there was the person who threatened to call the cops on the black bird watcher, uh, you know, and it seems almost funny. And then three days later, we see how unfunny it is, right? And, and that, that almost was the wish of this person who we saw be, you know, change her uh, whole me demeanor when calling 911. I mean, there was a real... Uh, firestorm, I think, in all of that. And, and people were able to connect the dots in ways that they might have, you know, uh, not before. Yeah. And I think part of helping to connect those dots were the, the killing of Ahmaud Arbery down in Brunswick, Georgia, just, um, which had happened in February. Mm -hmm. But the tape didn't come out until months later. But that tape had been in the hands of the police and the prosecutor's office. And they looked at it almost immediately and said, there's no crime here. 
And one of the prosecutors who then recused himself actually wrote a brief saying that the killing was in fact justified. So when you see this, this, this visual image of the, the pickup truck blocking Ahmaud Aubrey's path, and there's somebody behind him and he tries to go around and the next thing you know, there's a man with a shot. I mean, we're seeing it all and that none of that is matching up with the statement that the killers gave to the police. And so the police look at the tape, they look at the statement and they believe the statement. And so it's this questioning that is happening in the system. So it's the same as when you read the report coming out of Minneapolis where they're like, and we, the suspect had a medical issue. Uh, the suspect had a medical <laughs> issue. Ridiculous. Right, you know, it's just, um, and, and it's like the Buffalo police saying, and he tripped and fell. But there, there are two camera angles on that one. And he tripped and fell. So part of what is happening in America, I believe, is that you're seeing this deep questioning of the credibility and authority of those who had previously been held to be virtually unimpeachable. And I don't think that's a bad thing because what that whole unimpeachability had led to were a series of lies that eroded um, our well-being. And, 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 and so I'm, I'm fascinated and enthralled by the vision and the courage of those who are figuring out how do we get the America we deserve instead of this thing that has been foisted upon us. Um, I want to talk about two aspects of this uh, story that are um, potentially uh, uncomfortable. The first one is for me, which is that I, the dynamic of panel discussions like this, where uh, I know, Dr. Uh, Professor Anderson, you've, uh, you've done several, and I suspect, Kevin Young, you've done your share, too, where essentially a white guy comes, uh, invites some, some black people on and says, uh, explain racism to me. And the, the obvious uh, um, rebuttal, which I've seen many times online, is they're not the ones who need to do the work. I am. You are, Paul Wells. Um, is, what do you make of the sort of nonstop... Uh, uh, succession of, uh, of, of discussions like this that we see on C-SPAN, on CNN, and so many other places? I think it's twofold. I think one of the things that is happening is that because, and I'll talk about the U.S., because the U.S. is basically racially segregated residentially um, in our workspaces, um, where we go to church, and so it's really possible to live a life that is unimpeded by, structure, by structural racism. So you don't have to confront what it looks like. And then we're in this moment of COVID-19, this moment of, of a massive recession and high unemployment. We're seeing people who are desperate for food. And so food bank lines just stretching for miles. And you then see these images of authorities just flat out lying as they're beating and killing people. And it's like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? This isn't the America that I knew, or whether it's not the America that I've been told about, but how do I find out what's going on? And so the, the good part is that we, we are getting that questioning. The bad part is that we have had such, such sheltered existences that have allowed folks to go through their entire lives without really thinking about how that happened. Whereas black folks have had to navigate this thing early on. I mean, it's that moment when you, you, your parents are sitting down with you, helping to explain to you that those rules do not apply to you. There are a whole new set of rules that apply to you if you're going to survive. Ooh, and you learn that early as a, as, as a real small child. 
And, and so the questions of, so when I'm out giving talks on white rage, when we used to be able to go out and give talks, um, I would, you know, I would get to that point in, in, in my talk and people would say, but what do we do? And I'll say, this is the moment where white folk have to talk to white folk. And, and it's talking with each other based on facts and evidence, not, oh, this is wrong, but the facts and evidence that can help you understand how we got here. Um, so that becomes really important. And it also then helps because we're not sitting around the dinner table or in these segregated spaces, like at, you know, at the club or in, in work, where somebody says something that is just so vile and racist and gets embedded in the policy, in the hiring policy, in the loan making policy to have white sitting at the table going, uh, 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 uh. You know who the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action really are in college admissions? Boom. And, and being able to do that kind of work. So that's what you hear when you're hearing whites need to talk with whites. And the, the work is out there. Uh, scholars have been writing on race and racism and structural racism. Um, and how to be anti-racist for a while. Um, and so that's what these lists, I mean, the Schomburg put together a magnificent list. I should okay, actually- Kevin, that's, that was the bump, bump. <laughs> No, absolutely. The Black Liberation Reading List, 95 books listed on the Schomburg Center website, which you can find on the New York Public Library website. And I went through the list this morning. I've read six of the books, so I've got, I made a start of it, but I, you know, I got to keep going. Um, uh, Kevin Young, in so much of your work is about what it is to be American in all of its aspects, both your essays and your poetry. Um, what do you make of this new round of dialogue that's happening? Okay, you're uh -oh. muted. He seems to be muted. Yes. Why? Wow. seem to be a problem. There I am. <laughs> Here we go. You wouldn't let me unmute myself. <laughs> I take that as a metaphor for conversation, but uh, you yeah, know. we're not subtle. We're not subtle with things. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, you know, I think dialogue is, it's always been important. And it's always, you know, what I think uh, people don't understand about the civil rights movement is the ways that uh, if you see, say, SCLC videos or, or SNCC practicing to go into uh, an action, a nonviolent action, they're expecting violence and they plan it and they talk about uh, if there are white folks there, what they're going to do versus what the black people are going to do. These were all parts of the struggle, uh, both the dialogue and also the, the expectations of, of what might happen from law enforcement. Um, so in other words, we've been here before. We had Emmett Till, we've had Rodney King, we've had these videos and this evidence. Um, so I see it as a good thing that folks are interested and I'm hopeful as well. And this uh, list that the Schaumburg Center released, uh, the Schaumburg 95, it's a black liberation uh, reading list that uh, White Rage, of course, is on, a wonderful essential book, um, is a way to, you know, it's sort of both first steps and next steps. When I first started, we first started thinking about a list, I was thinking, you know, top 10, 20, and it just became clear you couldn't contain this rich tradition of black authored books about the struggle, but also about joy. So we want to expand it just beyond um, anti-racist, uh, which is there. I mean, you have to have that, but also to think about, you know, poetry. Uh, and poetry that thinks about history. People like Natasha Trethewey or Tracy K. Smith are writing about America. Um, there's a wonderful book by Tracy called uh, Wade in the Water, in which, which is on the list, and in it she has both a, a version of uh, the Declaration of Independence, where she did sort of a cut up paste of it, which is just powerful. Um, and then she also has these letters uh, that she used to create a poem around Civil War Union, Black Union soldiers who couldn't get their pension. And their mm. families, and uh, writing to them, we had an oratorio based on it at the Schomburg. I'm, I'm going to get too excited. Uh, <laughs> but the point is that this is out there, right? And we, we do this every day at the Schomburg Center, and we have for 95 years. So I think it isn't too much to ask to say, like, spend a little time uh, reading, looking, looking around, uh, and let's, we can't have such disparate 
uh, versions of this place that we all love, you know, and we want to see better. I don't think that's a, a, a unique desire, uh, but I do think it's, it is a unique situation that people have sometimes, you know, we, we used to hear the end of racism, you know, multiculturalism would take over and nothing, you know, uh, there, there isn't this problem. And I think that's also some of the shock uh, you're seeing and some of the need for not just dialogue, but for transcending sort of empty promises. You know, I think this is not the moment for, uh, like you were saying, like, you know, standing in solidarity. It's a moment for also, well, what does that mean? What does that solidarity look like? Uh, and it involves actions and uh, deeds. Uh, and I think that's very important right now. I also want to ask about the, what is suddenly the most uh, often discussed policy proposal, which is defunding the police. Um, and uh, we've seen uh, a lot of discussion on that. We've seen the Democrat uh, presumptive nominee for President Joe Biden say he's against this notion. We've seen individual city administrations begin to make the first steps. Um, Eric Garcetti, the, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, says he wants to increase social services spending by $250 million and reduce police funding in Los Angeles by $150 million which sounds impressive until you do the math, that's about 9% of the police budget in Los Angeles. Um, I know a lot of people are uh, uncertain, worried, defunding police sounds a lot like shutting police down. Why is it an idea that has, and I recognize that it doesn't, that, that, it, that in fact, it would not be anything close to doing that, but why is the idea of shifting some resources from policing to other community services suddenly something that so many people are talking about? I think uh, part, of, part of it is because of the wealth of video images that we have of the brutality raining down on, on, on people and the militarization of the police. So where they are, are basically looks like they're armed for war. And you begin to think about war on your own citizens. I mean, so that is part of what this discussion is. And one of the things I talk about at the end of, of White Rage, I have a, the epilogue is called Imagine. <laughs> and, and that is to actually imagine what happens if we don't have um, these bloated police budgets that are buying military gear and, you know, you saw, I think it was in New York, not New York, L.A., where they now have Teslas um, for, for police cars. Really? Um, and you begin to think that what happens if we take that, those funds and imagine what it's like to actually have mental health workers who can deal with these mental health crises? What does it mean in these budgets if what we have are... are are schools that are adequately funded um, so that regardless of your zip code, you get a high quality education. And so that imagining is part of what is happening in the, the language of defunding the police. It is to think about these budgets and where the priorities really are to have a strong, thriving population instead of one that is so heavily policed that they look like the, the what were the name of the, the Darth Vader folks? Yeah, the in, yes. <laughs> right, instead of seeing that. Yeah. I think also, you know, some of it is language that I think is scary to people because defunding, as you said, sounds different than divesting or reinvesting in our communities, which is I think what everyone on papers would like, but it sometimes doesn't happen. Uh, and, you know, I, we all know that schools should be better and, and that you should have access to the kind of information. Uh, you know, that was what the dream was, I think, uh, for desegregation. It wasn't so, so someone could sit by someone else. It was so that we had access to the same resources. Uh, and that hasn't happened in the way that we would want. Uh, and. It's hard to imagine, you know, and, and that's where, you know, isn't just Sunday, is it, is it the saying, like, there's nothing more segregated than Sunday uh, at noon in America? You know, there's also nothing more segregated, or you see people uh, become very invested in their own, uh, you know, 
selves race uh, around education, you know, and people start to segregate and, and do things that they might not otherwise do. And we need to make uh, that change, I think. And, um, you know, as someone whose parents uh, were the first in their families to go to college, you know, uh, grew up in the segregated South, I was always told education, if you study and you do these things, you can, you know, combat all these other things that are going to get thrown at you. Uh, and that mostly seems true until you start to think that sometimes schools are, are places that feed kids and keep them safe. You know, that's what, in a, in a country that has all these resources, suddenly that's the bar for uh, our schools is, is to provide meals to people. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I could go on and tell you more and more stories. Carol can tell you all the facts. Um, but I can tell you about, you know, my, my aunt saying, gosh, it's terrible how on Friday when I try to feed kids at this uh, program she has, I want to give them a little extra because I know they're not going to get to eat all weekend. And then the program says they can't give them that extra on Friday. Any part of that doesn't make your blood start to boil. The fact that school lunch costs anything, you know, just is puzzling to me. So we're in a, a situation where, you know, all that comes into this moment uh, of change uh, that I think is really necessary and long overdue. Given all of that, given as Carol Anderson writes in her book that part of the aftermath of Brown versus Board of Education, which, uh, um, um, in which the Supreme Court ruled out the notion of separate but equal uh, public education was that in Prince Edward County, Virginia, they simply shut down all public education for five years uh, and and uh, spirited the white kids away to um, state funded private schools and just and, and there was no school for the black kids yeah. and 50 years later they're still living through the, uh, the the terrible educational results for all Virginians that resulted from that is anyone else here nervous of that uh, as I am that defunding uh, police could be a noble idea that quickly gets badly subverted like, so that they hang on to the, all the paramilitary equipment, but shut down community presence and, 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 and storefront operations and the sort of things that might actually uh, help. Yeah. And that's one of the things about policy. Um, and that's why I, I spend so much time writing about policy. Um, and that's why it's going to require the, what they say, the cost of liberty, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. It's going to require a level of eternal vigilance as these policies start getting crafted to, to, to go beyond the smoke and the mirrors of the language of like school choice, what school choice was supposed to be, but what it really was, was a way to maintain separate and unequal schools, um, freedom of choice, uh, again, language playing with the reality of what's going on. The same thing is going to have to happen as these policies are dealing with um, the reconfiguration and the reimagining of policing in America, the, the, the rethinking and the reimagining of what strong, vibrant communities look like, how does that play out policy-wise? And the beauty is, is that I know that there are organizations that have been drafting these policies, that have been thinking about these policies, advocating for these policies. And it's going to require that they have a full seat at the table in order to ensure that the vision of what basically a human rights America would look like does not get, continue to get subverted by white rage. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would just say, uh, you know, I went to uh, I lived in Topeka, Kansas, growing up uh, for part of my childhood, and um, Linda Brown of Brown v. Board uh, went to my church and played piano in my church. And so my book, Brown, uh, there's many Browns in that book, but one is, is that. And I was painfully aware, being in Topeka uh, in the 80s even, that you know, they had to retry that case just for the desegregation of Topeka's actual, actual schools. And so, you know, we have a long way to go. Uh, the history has to be told better, more honestly. Uh, I think that's part of what we're talking about, too. Uh, I'm focused, you know, Carol, I think, is absolutely right about policy. And I 
also would love to see, you know, civics and, and education and poetry and all the arts that got stripped out of schools. That's part of this whole problem of not understanding the full person and not valuing, uh, you know, things that, you know, you don't know what's going to turn someone into the best musician of our generation or the, you know, well, the best historian of our generation. Best so, poet! <laughs> <laughs> It can be something we don't know. And I, I think that, you know, uh, there's a lot of resources that need to, that we say aren't there. And then suddenly they're there for things that we might not uh, want. And so I think we need to be honest about uh, what the resources are, what we're willing to prioritize. Um, and, and that's really where we're at right now. It, it does seem to be a moment when this, the country is speaking to the politicians rather than the other way around that, um, even the, 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 the most nimble and progressive uh, young democratic leaders are not leading what's going on in the States right now. It's, um, it's a street level up uh, and, and um, uh, uh, non-governmental organizations uh, leading the charge. And that is, I think, something that we haven't seen with such uh, force in quite a long time. And I think that this again speaks to the degradation that has happened to American institutions mm -hmm. over time, and particularly under the Trump regime, um, where you've seen the, the, the debasement of the executive branch, um, so that the DOJ really does, the Department of Justice really doesn't function as a Department of Justice anymore. It functions as Trump's personal attorney. Um, it's where you see um, the, the U.S. Senate, how the Republicans in the Senate refuse refuse to even look at the evidence uh, of, of Trump negotiating, uh, doing a quid pro quo, extorting the Ukrainian president. I'm going to withhold arms unless you um, smear the, my, who's going to be my political rival. So when you get the, the Senate not doing its job, when you get the executive branch not doing its job, and then when you get the federal judiciary so like in the, the case with uh, the voting case in Wisconsin, we're in the middle of a pandemic where the Democratic governor and is trying to get some kind of extension on the dates when the ballots, uh, absentee ballots can be postmarked because it's April 6th, they weren't able to get everything out and the election's on April 7th. And the Supreme Court says, well, you have to have your ballot postmarked in a 5-4 decision with the five conservatives on, the, on the, the, the Supreme Court saying you have to have your ballot postmarked by April 7th in order for it to count. So people who haven't even received the ballots yet must have that non-received ballot postmarked. Uh, and so when you're watching your judiciary just tell you how expendable your life really is. That is where you're getting this, the, the rising up of the people who are demanding a much more vibrant and inclusive democracy than the one that has been so debased and devalued this time. It's the 15th Amendment that, uh, that supposedly guaranteed voting rights? Yeah, the 15th Amendment, it's, it's what it, what it, it has a, a phrasing in there that says, the right to vote shall not be abridged by race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Yeah. So it doesn't say you have the right to vote, but it's saying that your right to vote can't be debased, abridged, based on those parameters. And there's been essentially a constant fight for the 150 years since then to determine whether that amendment has its full meaning and its, yes. and its, and its, and its moral force. Well, you know, and this is the Selma, Selma, the, the cataclysm on the Edmund Pettus Bridge at Selma, and then the, the bludgeoning death of Reverend James Reed shortly after that, just galvanized the nation and led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which has been called the most effective piece of legislation Congress has ever passed, because it worked. <laughs> it really worked. <laughs> um, and, and, and because it worked, because what it did was it created the protection of the right to vote by saying that states that had a, a pattern of discrimination 
had to get all of their voting rights changes okay by the U.S. Department of Justice or by the federal court in D.C. before implementation. That is why, because it worked so well, that, that thing had a target on it. Um, they came forward in 66, they came forward again in 68, and you kept seeing this challenge of the Voting Rights Act until we get to 2013, when the U.S. Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision gutted it. And in that gutting, just two hours afterwards, you saw these states that had been under the pre-clearance thing just boom, started implementing these racially discriminatory voting laws that have blocked millions of American citizens from the ballot box. Um, just yesterday, these incredible lines in, in Georgia. I was in Georgia voting or trying to, I, I was successful. But what's happened there, and maybe Carol, you know more than I do, but just my personal experience, they shifted the requirements so you have to have an ID, which I don't know why you have to have an ID, but you have to have an ID and to get an ID, they made it near impossible. You have to have proof of residence, you have to have proof of employment, you have to have a social security card, I dare someone to find theirs right now, you know. <laughs> All these things, uh, and I was—I had to register the day after Trump was elected. Actually, because um, my mm. birthday was then, and so the next day I went to 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 get a new ID, and they said to a person behind me, um, "You know, where's your uh, pay stub? You know, first of all, why do you need a pay stub to get an ID to drive, much less to vote? Because that's what they're trying to stop." And he said, "What's a pay stub?" Now, this was a healthy young person who I'm sure worked, but maybe they were worked a cash job, maybe, you know, you don't, shouldn't have any of these things. You should be able to be homeless and not jobless and whatever, and still be that citizen that gets to vote. And just yeah. personally, I was really shaken by the requirements that, uh, you know, were in place, which were, of course, a way of, of doing what Carol's saying, which is not allowing you to vote. And I think Georgia has changed long ago uh, from whatever uh, voting it used to have. And it's just suppression that's preventing uh, that from being clear. Right. I mean, the, the demographics in Georgia have changed dramatically, but you can't see that in the political structure because of all of the voter suppression that is happening. So after the, um, the Supreme Court decision, the state of Georgia has shut down over 200 polling places. 75% um, of those are in minority and poor communities. What we know from the research is that for every tenth of a mile that a polling place is moved from the Black community, that Black voter turnout goes down by 0.5%, up to four miles. So if you can move that polling place, say, four and a half miles away, you can expect to get about a 20% drop in black voter turnout because of the issues of transportation, the ability to have access, ease of access to that polling place. So when Georgia shuts down over 200 of these places, it is designed to stop black people from voting. The same thing with the machines. Um, when you have machines that don't work and you put those non-working machines in black precincts, then what you do is you're able then to create these long, long lines. So what happened yesterday was that in black neighborhoods, the line stretched from anywhere from three hours to seven hours. In white neighborhoods, like in Chastain Park, which is a wealthy white area, it was about five to seven minutes. Hmm. So again, when you have the kind of residential segregation so that people experience something as simple as the vote very differently. So when African Americans are talking about voter suppression, but you live in Chastain and you're like, what are you talking about? I got in, I voted, I left. Um, it, it creates that narrative of, oh, there they go complaining again. Yeah. But you have when the system, I call it bureaucratic violence. Wow. When the system, yeah, <laughs> You're writing that down. <laughs> when the system figures out how to wield policy and these bureaucratic changes in the law so that it eviscerates the civil rights of citizens, 
That's bureaucratic violence. And that's what we're seeing in voter suppression. And once again, the, the issues that you describe are as recent as yesterday in the primary voting in Georgia. And yes. uh, there's many more months of, of voting ahead, including the big one in November, the presidential election. Yeah. I, I would, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking still, though, about your question from before, and I don't want to get away from the voter suppression about the change that's going to happen or how the change is happening. And I think it is when people realize they can have an impact on the voting, uh, not just uh, by voting, but on the idea of how they can vote. And that this is a long story, that we had a respite from uh, for a few decades, maybe. Uh, but you know, this is a longer story that we need to connect to and understand in order to see why it's so important to have the Voting Rights Act. Um, we need to see why it's so important to make lynching a federal crime. You know, we, we have to have these protections in place. But I would also say something from the cultural side, which, um, you know, running a library and thinking about it just myself, I think about, which is, I think also culture comes from the ground up. And I think just from the poetry I've been seeing, you know, in my role as a poetry editor, and just the poetry I've been hearing, uh, it's been really heartening to see that a lot of our poets and thinkers have already been thinking about some of these things, just like our historians. And you see in this groundswell of attention, also a, a turning toward what poetry can do as a revolutionary force, uh, what music can do, how things can bring us together and transcend some of these kind of divides. Um, so to me, that gives me as much hope as, as yeah. the policy changes that I think need to come uh, yeah. fast and furious. Yes. I, um, I follow a lot of musicians on uh, Facebook and Instagram, a lot of American musicians, and uh, uh, some of the most anguished commentary that I've seen has come from black and white musicians who are trying to process this through the work that they do all, their all the time and, the, and the, the relationships that they have in music. And, and so it's no surprise that art is turning into, as it always does, an interpreter uh, and an observer and a commentator on what we're seeing happen. Um, we're very close to wrapping up. I want to um, uh, remind our listeners uh, and our guests of some of the things that have been happening during these last couple of weeks in Canada, because that's what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, in New Brunswick, Chantel Moore, who was a young Indigenous woman from uh, British Columbia, was uh, shot to death at a wellness check uh, um, held by police in Edmonston, New Brunswick, uh, very close to the day that George Floyd was killed. Uh, in uh, Nunavut, in the far north, an Inuit man was hit and uh, brought to the ground with the door of a police cruiser uh, in the middle of the street. Uh, in Belleville, Ontario, a police officer was photographed with a Confederate flag, which he posted proudly on his Facebook page. In Laval, Quebec, uh, there is video of police pulling a black man from his car by his hair. Uh, and of course, there's the case of uh, Regis Kuczynski Paquette, a young black woman in Toronto who fell 24 stories to her death from her balcony after an altercation with police. There's one report uh, from Toronto that says that between 2012 and 2017, blacks were 20 times likelier than whites to be shot dead by the Toronto police force. We have a lot to think about in Canada too. And we uh, will, here at McLean's, are going to be talking about some of these issues uh, and the changes that need to happen uh, on this show next week. But for now, I want to thank our two guests, um, Carol Anderson from Emory University, Kevin Young from the Schomburg Center at the New York Public Library, and the New Yorker Magazine. And I want to thank our uh, sponsors. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll let you take that call, Kevin. <laughs> Very popular. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate Thanks it. For having me. Thank you. Thank you so much.